Uh, Sabjit joins me now from Birmingham, from Rajuana TV, who's called in to talk to us about this subject, about whether the world cares, or indeed whether Sikhs care, about not only the plight of the 82-year-old gentleman who is currently on a hunger strike, and he's been on a hunger strike for over 150 days, his name Bapu Surat Singh Khalsa. Um, Sabjit, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Nihal. How are you, my friend? I'm um, very well, very well. Thanks for calling in, um, Sabji. Now, I, you know, it does. It, it makes me feel not great having to ask, do Sikhs care? Because, you know, I've done debates about different issues in the Sikh community before. We've been inundated with calls, texts and emails from the off. But this, I mean, I got one text in the first 25 minutes. And yet mm-hmm. over social media, now you could argue, of course, the same people who tweet and not listening to this show, and I completely accept that. But it did seem slightly odd to me. Yeah, I think... Um there's actually no excusing that, to be honest, and I think uh, Sikhs themselves need to have a little, uh, a good hard look at themselves. But I also think that there's a collective failure in the Sikh community to understand our own narrative. I think what you'll find, Nihal, is that you have a lot of Sikhs with passion, and they feel uh, they feel uh, really bad for what's gone on in, in, in India and for somebody like Bapu Sura Singh, but they, I think, find, find it hard to express that mm. in a way without getting their passion, you know, letting their passion overcome them. And I think a lot of this stems from the fact, like, say, Bapu Sura Singh, for example, an 82 year old grandfather who's engaged in a non-direct um, a passive hunger strike to release uh, illegally detained political prisoners he himself and you've had vj uh, this uh, bumbling guy that you've had before call him a radical uh, somebody who's been radicalized now in the 80s when the state machinery was operating outside judicial law the judicial process and the police themselves and through fake encounters extrajudicial killings and forced disappearances you had a punjab that literally had nothing to lose because the state had turned itself into physical extermination now some people did defend themselves through arms and thomas jefferson often said uh, said that when injustice becomes law resistance becomes duty now these people were labeled terrorists because they went for the gun bapu surat singh 31 years later is doing a non-direct passive protest and mm-hmm. he himself is also still being labeled a terrorist so i think this is where uh, sikhs become really disenfranchised and disenchanted with the system and indeed the international community at large as well not but so long ago I... the uh, yeah, cable wikileaks um nehal mm-hmm. uh, the americans um declared that between 91 and 93 41000 cash bounties were paid to the police for during the extrajudicial killing process we still haven't had an American land on Punjab soil or Indian soil to investigate this. We live in a country, Nihal, where decades after the Hillsborough disaster, we can have an independent inquiry. We live in a country where a, a, somebody could get pushed in a protest, uh, uh, Tom Linson. He can get pushed in a protest by a police officer, die a few hours later, and that copper is brought to book and criminal charges leveled against him. Punjab is in a place where these police officers or even these politicians, and some people have mentioned uh, the the Delhi massacres, the disparity between the two systems, the dual system, Kamal Nath entered India's cabinet after being um, seen at the the, the scene of the crime where he burnt, uh, direct people to burn the Kaab Ganj Gordara, historical Sikh shrine. And I won't reference a Sikh guy just in case people are talking about bias. Sanjay Suri, who worked for the CNN, saw Kamal Nath raise our historic Gurdwara to the ground with countless Sikhs in there who were taking refuge from the mobs. This guy entered India's cabinet, yet people like Professor Bullard are languishing on, on a trumped-up charge where one of the uh, uh, Supreme Court judges, Justice Shah, said, look, this is a case which where he's completely innocent. 133 witnesses said they couldn't place him at the scene of the crime. He wasn't given legal counsel when he was arrested. His mental state is, is in question, yet... These people are languishing in prison. Well, your Kamal Nath, your Jagdish Taitler, your um, Sajjan Kumar, not only are they walking freely, uh, Nihal, they're also running government. And not only are they running government, if you're in India's cabinet, you're also going to different countries for conferences and meetings for diplomacy, international relations. Let's bring it Why? back. Subject. I want, I want to bring yeah. it back to your first points, which yeah. I think are very important points about how the Sikh community goes forward in terms mm-hmm. of rallying support not only for its cause, but the cause of human rights full stop, because it was pointed out earlier on in the first hour that mm-hmm. this is, if you see this as a human rights issue, then has the Sikh community failed in, in getting on board other issues, non-Sikh people who languish in prisons around the world? And also as well, and this is something that was raised on my Twitter timeline, about the, the, the kind of sense that some Sikhs are uncomfortable with allying themselves to certain causes 
because mm-hmm. they're worried about the extremist elements that exist within the Sikh community and that they don't wish to support those. They do wish to support human rights. They may well be, quite understandably, angry about what happened 30 years ago. But they mm-hmm. are concerned about about some of these issues being hijacked. I think what you'll find is um, often, Nihal, I think we're guilty of not pressing our issues enough. And even when we had the case Le- Lair, I think it was the last year, not only were Sikhs weren't even the focal point of the Gersley Lair campaign, we were talking about uh, Christians being butchered in Assam. We were talking about the Muslims in Gujarat. We were talking about the oppression in Nagaland. We were talking about the oppression across the uh, the Indian uh, sort of subcontinent. And I think this is where things do get hijacked, and the media plays a big part. Even in the 80s, a lot of our demands were sort of um, non-religious. There were two, three religious demands, but they were hijacked and made to look like a religious sort of movement, which, you know, if we're asking for greater water rights, it's not going to um, discriminate itself to say, is this electricity or water going to a Hindu's house or a, or a mm. Sikh's or a Muslims. It was for the entire Punjab, but that issue was hijacked. And I think Sikhs have done a commendable job, actually, in highlighting other people's issues, despite the fact that we have been on the receiving end of not only genocide after genocide, of not having any justice. So despite our uh, genocide, we are actually still talking about those in Nagaland. If you see Sikhs in Nepal doing a fantastic job of rebuilding houses, even though a lot of our the, the people who have suffered from the 80s, they are starving, they are destitute. But we're in Nepal helping those poor people from the earthquake. Whichever country we're in, Nihal, we're in the news for feeding the homeless. So we, we aren't the type of people just to talk about ourselves. But I think there's this fear and psychosis that when we do talk about ourselves, that we are somehow going to be labeled terrorists. Because our martial spirit is fine when we're fighting on the First and the Second World War. Our martial spirit is fine when we're fighting for India against Pakistan and China. But when it comes to our own issues, I think then that's when uh, we are seen as some kind of communal uh, uh, separatist. But it's it's seen, I guess, away from the communal separatist issue, just the issue of... Of, of, of an anger and perhaps even some people argue that um, some elements who wish to resort to violence which many Sikhs you know mm-hmm. find quite quite disturbing because of course the Sikh religion is an incredibly peaceful religion at its very heart and very core and very accepting of others and of therefore course. a lot of Sikhs who are just normal Sikhs going about their business um, and are greatly troubled by the lack of justice that the Sikh community mm-hmm. have received in the 30 years since 1984. But they do take an issue with certain things that are happening amongst younger members of the Sikh community. And I, I, the only reason I'm saying this is because so many people have called up over the years and said this live on the radio about these issues. And someone said it on the timeline before. So it's a case of saying, look, is it a case of saying, look, you can support these issues. Supporting these issues doesn't, doesn't mean that you want Khalistan. Mm-hmm. I mean, uh, you know, obviously, Khalistan is a completely different debate. Exactly, altogether. that's the point. But, but, it, uh, but does, are there those who wish to conflate it? And, 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 and what do you do about that? Because that is a risk of alienating more moderate Sikhs, isn't it? Of course. But this, this, this again, this is the na- narrative that people are failing to understand. Now, even Operation Blue Star, we're told that it was uh, done because of Khalistan. In fact, Operation Bla- Blue Star gave birth to it. Now, if 31 years later, somebody like me, Nihal, who's born in Birmingham, I was, eight, I was three years old when Operation Blue Star happened, mm. why is 1984 still raw to me? It's because we haven't had our Nuremberg trials. We are constantly being asked to move on and reconcile with any, without any rehabilitation, without identification of the criminals, without a judicial process against them, without sentencing them. So without that process, you will have young men who will feel disenfranchised and disenchanted. And then it's not just within the Punjab, around the world, Nihal, if you're going to create a system where people are being treated differently, then you will have abnormal responses to that. Mm. Well, yes, uh, for every, yeah, there is a reaction. There is a reaction. There's no doubt about about that. Well, look, we, we, we obviously... Uh, regardless of, of, of who Phil, you, we do not want to see an 82 year old man starve himself to death on the basis of this. Now, subject, I guess from a Rajuana TV perspective, what is the next move? Because if this poor man does unfortunately pass away, yeah. uh, and I, we pointed out earlier on, you know, because I spoke to someone hard deep in Bristol, I remember, who was saying that, you know, he had no faith that the Indian justice system will sort this out, then, then where are you left to go? Um, and that, that's a that's probably a scary thought, to be honest, because um, if Babu Sula Singh uh, does lose his life, then the, we've already seen in the past week um, there's been a flag march in in the Punjab from the army because they do sense that 
something is going to happen. Babu Sura thinks uh, his every constitutional right to his own life is being violated. He, you know, people are saying he's being transferred to hospital. He hasn't been transferred, he's been kidnapped. So if Babu Sura Singh does lose his life and we have another, another Shaheed on our hands, then it's up to it's up to the government to, to, to make that move because the people who are in the wrong are the ones who have imprisoned people based on their thought and not any criminal action. The people who have abducted Bapu Surat Singh from his home and sent him to a hospital and force-feeding him glucose through a drip without giving him a bath. And incidentally, if but, we but, but, but where that, next, subject? Now, I understand all that, but where next? Where, where next? And wh- this is, where this do you go? The Sikh community need to rally round. Not only do they need to get Bapu Surat Singh and safeguard him, but they also need to get the Indian establishment to make that change. Because the, the way... And how much of a change can you well. make from Birmingham, from Leicester, from Toronto? It's, it's, it's a kind of uh, change that perhaps I, I could make when uh, I'm looking at starving kids in Africa and I make a bit mm. of a donation. You know, I'm helpless, but I'd have to try and do my bit. Um, and hopefully, if everyone does do their little bit, we can get some kind of resolution. And I'm of a firm believer that if, if we continue to live in that system, then Sikhs will be alienated even further. So my, my solution is completely different to perhaps some of the callers that you've had. But in the short term, the, the, the ball is firmly in the Indian, Indian establishment's court. Okay. Now, is the, it's for them to do the right thing, and we don't expect them to. We don't expect a government who for 30 years have given impunity to killers and rewarded them. But we live. We are living in the year 2015. India wants to be a permanent member of the uh, Security, Security Council. Council yeah. So let, let let the world see what they what they do to these Sikh political prisoners. Let the world see how they will treat an 82 year old grandfather. Will they continue to label him as, as a terrorist and abduct him from os- one hospital to another? Or will they actually try and do the right thing? Right. Well, Sabjit, it's uh, been good to speak to you here on the BBC Asia Network this afternoon. That was Sabjit from Rajwana TV.